here. So um, I've already been cut short by five minutes before I start, but um, please feel free to interrupt at any point to ask questions because that's really the point. Um, so I'm going to talk about dense model theorems, which um, are when small sets look like they're large. Um, and uh, this is a an sort of area of intersection between um, additive combinatorics, I guess, um, and um, computational uh, theory. So um, in general, there's there's this notion, there's a uh, a sort of language barrier that has to be penetrated in both directions, um, and uh, uh, especially a uh, number of people who have been making that effort that I'm going to, to draw on. Uh, what I'm going to show today is that somehow this, there's a relationship between um, a theorem that was proved in additive combinatorics and a theorem that I proved several years ago in complexity theory. Um, and that the two are, are, there's a direct reduction from one to the other, and then show that there's some benefits to using that reduction um, rather than uh, to give new proofs of, of the theorem. Um, okay. So, um, so what, were, what, were, um, what was being done in additive combinatorics? So, just recently, Green and Tao proved that the, their um, arbitrarily long arithmetic regressions in the set of primes. And uh, they, they were leveraging some work uh, of Zemmeretti. I'm not sure from quite how long ago, but it was fairly long ago, that said, if you've got, you know, let's have a universe of all numbers up to, from 1 to n, and if we got a very large set, some constant density, we call that m, okay, and uh, the size of m is delta times the size of u, where delta is a uh, is a constant independent uh, of n, then, um, then m has arbitrarily long arithmetic progressions. Okay. So they wanted to use this for the primes, but the problem is really the primes is a very small set. Okay. So they said, you know, Zem already proved that large sets have, have um, have these long arithmetic progressions, but primes aren't large enough to apply that to. Okay. So the, um, the in intuition for what they did was they said, let's um, go to a, a slightly larger set, almost primes. Okay. And almost primes are those numbers that don't have a small, um, don't have any small prime factors. So something like all the prime factors are bigger than n to the alpha, and primes are dense within the set of almost, almost primes. Okay. Now, they said, well, if we look at Zemmeretti's proof that arithmetic progressions exist in this set, it goes via certain um, quantitative uh, tests that random elements of the set, set uh, satisfy. Okay. Um, so there's a certain family of tests that if you've if you've got certain values under these tests, then uh, for random elements in your set, then you have these uh, arithmetic progressions. And I'm not quite sure what these tests are. So, well, some. Okay. Okay. Um, what he said. <laughs> 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 um, so, uh, so anyway, uh, so what they showed is that for this class of tests, almost primes looks like the whole universe. So the the characteristic, if you pick random almost primes, then uh, with respect to this body of tests, 
they behave on average like random numbers. Okay? So the almost primes is, is pseudo-random with respect to this class of tests. Okay? And what we'd like to say then is that, well, the primes are dense, and this looks um, in, in the almost primes, the almost primes looks like the whole universe of numbers, so therefore the primes looks like some dense set of numbers with respect to these tests, and therefore, like, like these numbers, these tests have certain values that indicate that the primes have arbitrarily large in arithmetic progression. Okay. So, but then, uh, so then the question is, okay, well, we have a set that's dense within a pseudo-random set with respect to a given set of tests. Can we lift that set into this kind of dense model um, where this set looks like this set with respect to the same class of tests or a related class of tests? So that's, um, so that's the, the existence of such a model, the conditions under which such a model exists, and for what families of tests, that's the, the dense model theorems that I'm going to discuss a variety of, okay, and a variety of techniques for proving, for, for doing this kind of lifting operation. So is the general idea of what we're, we're shooting for clear? Okay. Okay. So, um, so uh, now it's interesting that this, they're using this notion of pseudo-randomness with respect to a, a bunch of, to a, a class of tests. And this, this idea of uh, computational indistinguishability or pseudo-randomness has a long history within complexity theory. Um, I think the, the first, I mean, you could, you could say that the, the Turing test for intelligence has this same kind of flavor, but the first explicit um, introduction of the idea of computational indistinguishability is Yao's, uh, in 82, introduced the notion of pseudo-randomness. And then uh, Goldreich, Macaulay, and Rockoff in 85, uh, I think, are the ones that just talked about more general computational indistinguishability. So the, so the general picture is we have um, two distributions on the same underlying universe, and I'm drawing them as, as not intersecting, but they could be any, any relation. And we have a class of tests, and we'll say that the two distributions are the tests are functions, right, from the universe. Now, in complexity theory, we usually think of tests as either outputting a Boolean value, 0 or 1. Uh, it actually doesn't make any difference and I think is more useful um, for, for some of the, the applications if we allow tests to take on intermediate values uh, between 0 and 1. But they have to be in some bounded range. Okay. Um, so, uh, We'll have some category of tests, and um, just to, to get things clear, I'm going to assume that uh, that constants are always in in the constants zero and one are always in our class of tests, and uh, that if we have a, a function t in our in our class of tests, then one minus t is also in our class of tests. So you can do negations. Okay. Almost all useful classes have, have these closure properties. If not, you just simply have to close them under these operations before applying the, the theorems. Okay. So, um, so we'll say that the distributions are, are epsilon indistinguishable. If for every test in, in tau, the expectation if you pick x according to d1 of t of x minus the same expectation if you pick it 
according to D2 is differ by at most epsilon. Okay, so this says if your test is trying to tell whether your, the sample is from D1 or from D2, that it has very low probability of being able to tell which one it's from. So if a class of tests were simply all functions, then it would be the L1 distance. That's true. Okay. So, um, so that provides a, a concrete notion of what um, it means for two, uh, two sets to look alike. Okay. And something pseudo-random, if it looks like the uniform distribution, if it's indistinguishable from the uniform distribution on the underlying universe. Okay. Um, most of the time, I'm going to assume that we're, we're dealing with, a, with sets, at least initially, but um, pretty much everything that I'm saying uh, is equally valid for, for general, more general distributions. And we'll sometimes have to go from one to the other. Okay, so what is our goal? So our goal is to say we've got some set S, and that's going to S is going to act like the primes in that picture, and it's embedded in some superset R, okay, um, but S is not too much smaller than R, okay, and R is, okay, so I'll use, sorry, so when um, two distributions are epsilon indistinguishable, I'll, I'll write that as D1 is similar sub epsilon D2, um, and that just mean, means the above. So you're and uh, I'm also going. Right? What? The J is fixed. The set t tau. Yeah. Is that's supposed to be T is tau for tests, or rather than J for nothing or other. <laughs> uh, so um, so the set script T or tau of tests is going to be fixed. Although we're going to have to look at um, related classes of tests. So um, we're going to be, you know, saying if one if one thing is indistinguishable from some class of tests, maybe some other things are indistinguishable via some related class of tests. Okay. Um, so maybe that's a good good segue. So the um, so we're the in particular we're going to be going from tau to a related class of tests, tau k, where um, tau k is the, is the set of functions of the form is sum of ti of x Uh, greater or equal to some, I should say, let's say, alpha i ti of x greater or equal to some r, where each ti is in tau and alpha i is either, is usually plus or minus 1, and r is going to be in the range. Okay. Um, So that's the, yeah, so this is the saying is, is, this is saying the truth value, the function whose truth value at x is this, is the truth value of this predicate. Okay? So k prime um, is less than or equal to k. So you have up to k, k functions from the original set, and you're asking some question about whether uh, some weighted linear combination of them is bigger than some, some particular value. Okay. And since we're allowed uh, plus or you know plus or minuses, uh, then uh, we can uh, 
assume it's greater than or equal to, less than or equal to is, uh, is identical. Okay. So, um, so often we'll have to start off with an assumption about indistinguishability from, from this more general class of tests and only get um, a conclusion about indistinguishability versus this more limited class of tests. But uh, often the two are related. Okay. So, um, so dense model theorem, we have S, R, and the size of S is at least delta times the size of R. The uniform distribution on, on R is, is epsilon indistinguishable from the d uniform distribution on the whole set. Oh, I already wrote that, but I'll write it again. Okay. So R looks like U, and what we want to say is that there is a model, oh, I should say with respect to uh, tau K for K is order Okay, so one example is k can be order 1 over epsilon squared delta squared. There are other trade-offs between how big we have to make k, but we want it to be fairly small as functions of epsilon and delta. And then we say there exists a model M, uh, a set where it's... Um, the model where the, um, this model is really a big fraction of the universe, of the whole universe, same size as uh, S is to, to R, and, um, and uh, S is indistinguishable And we're going to lose a little bit in the indistinguishability, a one in delta fraction, and that is sort of tight, uh, from M via for the original set of tests tau. Can that equal any set of tau? This is tau? So tau is more than arbitrary? Tau is arbitrary. The only thing we're assuming is it has constants and is closed under under complement. Okay. So this is this is true. Now you can have other ver so this is a theorem. There are other versions of this theorem where you know you have different trade-offs between the parameters, like k might have a different a slightly different value as a function of epsilon or delta, or maybe you lose a little bit less in terms of, of the indistinguishability, or there's a slightly different construction of, of relationship between this class of tests and this class of tests. So this is true for every S? So this is true for every S. Um, yeah, so this is for every S, for every R, um, and for every set U, and for every class of predicates tau. Any, yeah, or any, yeah, so any, exactly. Uh, My memory is they use something like uh, transverse transmission. They may use it. We're going to use something different but because I don't know that. Oh, oh, I see. So then they, they do one last step. They, they do one last step that uses stone virus stress, I think is that they, they don't want to work with tau sub k, these linear inequalities. They want to work with products. And so they estimate, you know, they estimate these kind of functions by, low, by polynomials and then use the monomial, show that one of the monomials has some. some but that's a technical term. But that's a technical, yeah. So, um, and it's also self-contained. You know, once you have this, you can always plug that in. Okay. Well, I mean, it's, 
I'm not saying I'm not saying um, this is my I'm not saying this is my theorem except for maybe some of the parameters. So let me give some of the references. So as I mentioned, Green and Tao were using some some ideas like this Im implicitly. Uh, Tao and Ziegler uh, did it explicitly in a SQL paper. Then um, then Gowers. Uh, got an improved version that pretty much matches the, these per kind of parameters uh, just just this year. And also um, Rheingold, um, Trevisan, Tulsiani, and Vadan uh, also uh, gave uh, proof. Um, and what I'm going to show you today is that we can get a proof. So the interesting about their thing about their proof that sort of alerted me to something interesting going on here that I should pay attention to was they said our proof is modeled after a proof of the hardcore uh, sets lemma of Impiazzo. So I said, hmm, <laughs> maybe there's, uh, you know, when you when you have one proof modeled after another, maybe that actually hints that there's a a stronger connection. Um, and actually, I was able to give a direct reduction not to my proof of the hardcore lemma, but to a version by uh, Thomas Holenstein um, done uh, several years later that has one subtle parameter that's, that's different. Um, and uh, and uh, so that's what I'm going to talk about today, is the reduction from this theorem to uh, a theorem about uh, that's more um, Directly about about com the complexity of functions. So in the green tau, they used it, or they used some variant of it? I'm just a curious. I think it's just I, I I can't say that I don't think they spelled it out in green and tau at least. But I haven't actually read their paper, so I I can't say for sure. Uh, this paper, oh, I should say also there's an interesting generalization. Um, by three of the last three of those authors that just came on EEC last week, um, that has a sort of generalization, uh, an e even more general statement than the dense model theorem. But I'm not going to talk about that because I really, I just was reading it last night, haven't really digested it. Okay, so, um, so, so I'm going to prove this by a direct reduction to another theorem. Um, so let me make a, a, I have to make a digression and, go, and talk about what this, this hardcore set theorem is. Okay. I'm not sure. Okay, well, I'll, I'll write it over here. Can people see this? Okay. So. The hardcore set theorem, sort of like, um, came up because saying like, when we're trying to argue about functions being hard on average, so we had some function f, and we wanted to argue that it's hard, it's hard some fraction of the time. And again, we'll have this with respect to some class of, of functions tau. Okay, it plays the same role as before. What it means to be hard, think of tau as the easy to compute functions. And we want to say there isn't a function in tau that computes f um, almost, almost everywhere. So we'll say that this is um, f is delta hard. And note that this delta is mysteriously the same letter as that other delta. So that should start getting you thinking. Um, that for tau, if for every t, and now we'll think of, of t as not a test, but as a, um, a predictor for the value of f, the probability over x in some universe that um, t of x equals f of x 
is at most 1 minus delta. So say for any way we have of guessing, easy, easy to compute way of guessing what f of x is, there's a delta fraction of inputs on which, which it's hard. So I guess f is uh, just a function on the universe and so on. Yeah, so f, f is just a function from u to, now in this case, uh, f is a Boolean function. So when I, when I, you know, we, uh, here, and, I, and I'll assume for now that the, the t's are, um, t are, are uh, Boolean, but if they're n not Boolean, you can in interpolate them as into Boolean functions by saying, if they give you a value between 0 and 1, flip a coin and have that, with that bias, and have that be your output, and this is the probability that we're talking about. <coughs> okay. So, um, so saying that f is hard at least some fraction, non-negligible fraction of the time, and we wanted to, I wanted to actually like say, you know, but you know, this what fraction of the time it was seemed to depend on this, on what, how you were computing it, where the hard examples were, and I was say, thinking. You know, wouldn't it be a lot easier to understand uh, hardness if there were just one distribution where um, those were the hard instances and everything else was the, were the easy instances and you knew which was, which was which? And after thinking about it for a while, I realized that you could do that um, with one proviso that Thomas uh, filled in a, a number of years later. So what the hardcore theorem says is that... Um, if f is delta hard, this is the hardcore, the version of the hardcore theorem from Holenstein's paper. If f is delta hard for t k, and again k is order uh, delta square one and delta squared epsilon squared. Um, then, oh, um, so then um, there exists a set, let's call it uh, script H, that's a subset of U. The, the size of the set um, is the set is exactly a two delta fraction of the universe, and for every t in in t, the probability over x not drawn just from this set H that f of x equals t of x is at most a half plus epsilon. Okay, so what we get is. I'm going to draw the picture. I know this can't be moved, but we won't need the picture for very long. Okay. So we have this set. We have this function is hard with a delta fraction, a delta fraction of the time. We have this set. We can divide up the universe into, into the hard set and everything else. And what this is saying is the reason why it's hard a delta fraction of the time is that it's really, really hard on this hard set. You can't guess better than, significantly better than flipping a random coin and, and using that as your output. So, uh, there's no condition on the set function. Or I just can't think of them as subsets. Yeah, but they're just the same conditions. They close under a complement. Uh, they can contain constants. But remember, we're going from tau. We have to have hardness for tau k linear uh, linear inequalities over tau. Okay. So, um, okay. So, so let me, um, okay, and the, 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 the ten year gap between the original version and this version um, all had to do with this number two, 
uh, my original version, it wasn't there. Um, and so, you know, intuitively, you should have, a, if you're easy to compute one minus delta of the time, and you're like a random coin flip on a two delta set, then you should be easy the rest of the time. Okay. So, so now if you say that way, it should do with the Yep, it does. <laughs> but it's, you know, this, I thought it was until I said, you know, actually it has a pretty simple proof. Okay. Um, I should say that there are actually um, two styles of proof for the hardcore set theorem. There's the, what's called the Nissan, um, min-max style of proof that's, that's pretty much non-constructive. And there's the boosting style proof. Okay. Uh, that was, so this, this also appeared in my paper because Noam didn't want to be a co-author. Um, and, uh, and, so the, the, um, no, uh, well, this is, this is the Gower's, so the, the T, the RTTV proof and the Gower's proof are both along these lines of the dense model theorem. Um, and, uh, but, um, But uh, the, I don't know, the boosting proof that I'm, I'm giving is using, uh, actually, even though I didn't know it, was using an idea uh, that was introduced by Shapira in learning theory in 1990 and also by Freund. Um, and this was explicitly pointed out that that's what I was doing by Clivens and um, Cervetio in 99. Um, so the boosting style proof. Now, I guess you could, so there's, then there's this kind of ergodic style proof, and RTTV gives uh, an ergodic style proof, um, but that was what was uh, the green and tau uh, originally used. Um, okay. <laughs> okay. So now the the um, the uh, advantage of using of giving a direct reduction though is that this Nissan proof Nissan style proof or the uh, the ergodic proof is not very efficient doesn't get you very good parameters the Nissan style proof is non-constructive um, in that it's hard to tell what the model looks like or give any algorithm for describe for constructing the model. But the boosting proof, um, even with the, the factor of two, and, and Holenstein also gives a version of the boosting proof, is very constructive. And in, when we combine this um, with, with, uh, with um, so once we have a direct reduction, we're free to pick the proof of the hardcore set theorem that we like. I like the boosting proof because it actually has algorithmic consequences and gives you a very strong characterization of what these models look like. Um, at least like some kind of probability distributions on models. So the models you get are measures rather than sets. Okay. Um, the other advantage, I should say, the, so, the, so the advantage of giving the reduction is to be able to use this boosting style argument and get a more constructive notion of what the model looks like. But also, um, my reduction, actually, um, we're going to just almost totally eliminate the need to discuss this pseudo-random superset and replace that with a notion of when a set looks like it's bigger than it is with respect to a bunch of tests. And it's going to follow, you know, if a set is a dense subset of a, of a, ran, of a pseudo-random set, it'll, that it will have this computational density, but there might be other reasons why a, a set has computational density, and 
um, that are easier to, to prove. Okay, so I'm going to define computational density and then give some intuition about the reduction. Um, I had some other things planned, but I don't think I'm going to get to them. Um, some, I had some examples of applications in mind, but it doesn't look like I have time. Okay. So, um, so when is a when is a set? You know, when does a set look small, and then we'll reverse that and use that to prove that a set is big. Well, if you had a a test that sort of contained the set and not much more, and the test didn't didn't wasn't wasn't true very often, that would be a witness that the test was large. Or maybe I should say, when is a set big? A set is big if the probability of any, any event when x is drawn from, this, from the whole universe, well, that's at least the probability that x is in this subset S times the probability of the event given that x is in the subset s. It's kind of trivial. So if s is big, this is at least delta. The probability for the whole universe is at least delta times the probability of the same event um, for the subset. So we'll say that a, a test t is distinctive if it if it has this, this property, we're going to actually make, insist on something a little bit stronger. Okay, so we'll say that uh, a test is distinctive, so it proves that the set is small, smaller than epsilon, if this fails in a strong way. If the probability of the event in the whole universe is less than or equal to delta times the probability of the same event when x is from the subset, and then we're going to say minus some non-negligible amount epsilon. And the per role of this epsilon is to prevent us from looking at tests that are almost where this is almost zero and this is almost zero. So I don't really want to count those. I want to look at those tests that are true a non-negligible fraction of the time on S, and but are are true only a very small amount of the time in U. Okay, and that's sort of an evidence that that S is small, and the lack of evidence that S is small is going to be this computational density. So S has epsilon computational density. delta for tau if there are no epsilon delta distinctive tests in tau. Okay? So if the reverse is true for every test in tau, the value of the test on u is at least some fraction of its value on s. And that fraction is the pseudo density. Whenever, whenever the test is true on S, a, a fairly large amount of the time. So that's just a pseudo entropy. So we're going to relate it to the pseudo entropy, but it's not clear that it's the pseudo entropy because pseudo entropy has to do with the existence of this model. Okay, so um, so now I'm going to make a, a new version of the. Okay, but say, okay, yeah. So instead of um, saying that, say we're going to replace these two conditions, that S is a big fraction of a pseudo-random set with a, a simpler condition, in my mind, we're going to say S has, has pseudo-density Epsilon pseudo density delta. And it clearly follows from being um, 
this, this property clearly follows from these two things, but the reverse isn't clear because this doesn't mention the set R at all. Okay? And we'll get the same conclusion. Okay? And the way we're going to do that is a direct reduction to this hardcore theorem. Okay? So, um, so let me give the reduction. So what we're going to do is basically pick f to be the characteristic function of s. Okay? But we're going to assume for now, we'll assume that s is a really, really small set, set inside the universe so that the size of s is negligible. It'll turn out that we don't actually need that, but for the sketch I'm going to give today, we're just going to assume that. S, the size of s within the universe is negligible compared to this epsilon and the delta. Okay, and we're going to let f be the characteristic function of s. Now, unfortunately, we can approximate this function on the, on the, dist on the uniform distribution on u almost certainly by just saying no. <laughs> it's not, you know. Almost uh, the f is almost constantly zero. So, in order to make um, to make things challenging, what we need to do is make f at least somewhat likely to be one. So we're going to change the distribution. We're going to take s and sort of remove it from u, and we're going to blow it up, and we're going to you know make this part look at the distribution where we have some delta prime probability of sampling from s and 1 minus delta prime sampling from the complement of s. And since, since s is so small, sampling from the complement of s is almost the same as just sampling from the whole universe. Okay. So, um, and delta prime is just going to be delta over 1 minus delta. That works out. So, okay. So So f is going to be the characteristic function for s, but not applied to the universe, but on this kind of skew distribution. Okay? And note that everything works for arbitrary distributions, including the hardcore set theorem. There's a general way of saying if you want a non-uniform distribution, we can map it to the uniform distribution. It's not, it's not an issue. Okay? So now what I claim is that the pseudo density delta implies that f is delta prime hard on this distribution. And it's really just, that's just a matter of a few simple calculations, which if I had a minute, um, which I don't have, I could show you. Okay? Um, so f is hard for this distribution, and therefore we get a hardcore set. Well, on this hardcore set, the characteristic function has to be, uh, has to be um, as hard as, as flipping a coin. And for all tests in the, in the set, and the constant functions are in the set, and that means that the characteristic function has to be unbiased on the hardcore set. Well, so that means if you look at the hardcore set, to be delta to, we have to have a hardcore has to be two delta prime big on this distribution, okay? And so, and it has to be unbiased, which means it has to have all of the places where the function is one, and delta prime fraction of places where the function is zero, okay? So you, also leading here, right? Because um, here we have call the frat part of the hardcore in the, in the, from the part where the function is zero, call that m, and that's going to be our model. Why? Because if we had a, a test, the characteristic function is one here on the hardcore, it's zero here in the hardcore. If we had a test that told us which side we were on with any probability, that would also give us a prediction for the function on the hardcore. Okay? And then, it's also just easy to see by our choice of delta prime that the size, you know, m has to be a delta prime fraction within this whole set, which is exactly the same as saying m has to be exactly a delta fraction of the, of the set u, of the underlying space u. Yeah? So h is going to have to be 
S union M. So it, it has to be unbiased on H, so it, and it has to be size 2 delta prime. The only way that can happen is if it has exactly this form, all of S, or almost all of S, and uh, a delta fraction of the universe in addition. Okay. That's the same as here. So that's the same here. It's a, so the, the <coughs> tau k versus tau follows from, from the hardcore. The choice of k follows from the hardcore. Um, the only thing that was crucial was that we needed the hardcore to be exactly size 2 delta, 2 delta prime uh, in order to say that it had, equal, it had all of s and an equal size set over here. Okay, so that's the whole reduction. Um, and the neat thing is if you use the boosting argument, you can actually show that um, uh, the model you'll get has the following form. Okay, so instead of a, of a set, we're going to look at a measure. Okay, where mu of x basically says the probability that x is in M. So mu of x is going to be in the range 0 to 1, and m is going to be sampled by picking, the distribution in m is going to be sampled by picking uh, every elm, putting x in m with this probability mu of x. And uh, it's going to turn out that mu of x is going to be a piecewise linear function of, of um, at most at most k uh, tests from tau. Okay. So actually the the dist you know basically the measure that you get is defined in the same almost the same way as um, the 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 uh, so the hardcore, you know, there's this kind of duality between the hardcore that you find or the model that you find has the same form as um, uh, as the uh, the distinguisher that you'll find. Both of them are just sort of uh, almost linear functions with a, uh, of um, of tests from your tests from your set. And I was going to give a few. Uh, a few examples of how we can apply this, um, but I'm already five minutes over the, you know, not even including the five minutes that <laughs> Jean took. <laughs> so, um, so I think I'll end there. Yes. Uh, so I don't know that that's a that's a very good point. Um, I, I said that there's this kind of linear programming proof uh, by Nissan, and there's a boosting proof. You could say there's a linear programming proof by Ms. Nissan and a linear programming proof by boosting, because um, Freund and Shapiro also show that basically boosting is. Uh, you can think of boosting as um, a technique for converging quickly to an almost equilibrium for a zero sum, a certain zero related zero sum game. Um, and if you look at boosting that way, you're right. It was actually known before. Um, this general, this general sort of uh, loop was known before 1990, uh, before the learning theory community rediscovered it. On the other hand. Uh, I don't know of a general, I don't know of any way of saying, of using that insight into boosting to say that these two proofs are really the same. They do seem, you know, both are in, in inherently using linear programming, but one is using it in a non constructive way, the other is using it in a constructive way. You could say that the boosting is a constructive proof of the min max, and therefore. It, to some extent, but we're not, it actually isn't the same game. 
We're not applying it to the same zero sum game. The statement of the R call lemma is a statement about the change of quantifier. Yeah. Of yeah. The connection to min max and the Yeah. Uh, Um, so, uh, Trevis, so, so this paper, the RTTV paper also gives an ergodic style proof of the hardcore set theorem, but it, it, the parameters are much worse and it doesn't quite get exactly what, what I want. I would imagine the, the whole of the strong biasing there too is just to relate this from K to J basically. Yeah, yeah, so this is. This is only be so the only the only do that at the end if you're not happy with this tau k and want to do something more algebraic. So what is tau k? Tau k, yeah. If you're ha already happy with linear. But by somebody really wrote the proof of the strong for principle in, in this language or, or not? Uh, or it's kind of loose just to get. So I want to see how close is this kind of a, a parallel or it's it's really in their stuff is really embedded. Um, I think it's really embedded. It's it, you know. a similar was an explicit version of the transference principle, and uh, this paper RTTV uh, gave, gave it in this language that uh, Russell, so they just reproved it in this computational language. And what Russell does is just directly reproved rather just than reprove it from the old theory. Maybe we delay the starting point uh, 